The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by Alt Playground. APG is more than just a place to find couples to swap with. Alt Playground is a lifestyle community for all non-monogamous and sexually adventurous people to connect and share. And you know I started a profile. Join me over at altplayground.net. That's A-L-T playground.net. You always need new underwear. And you always love a good deal. Topic Wear is a luxurious undergarment brand that's partnered up with both myself and NBA star Serge Ibaka to leave your naughty parts soft and comfortable during this indefinite sexual off-season. Get 20% off your next order of undies with promo code MANHOR at TopicWear.com. That's code MANHOR at T-O-P-I-K-W-E-A-R.com. The Man War Podcast is sponsored by HotMovies.com. Try out some ethical, paid-for porn for free with none of those hidden fees or secret subscriptions when you sign up at HotMovies.com and use the promo code MANHOR. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man War Podcast. Just because there's not going to be a parade doesn't mean it's not pride. Happy June to all of my listeners who get to have a really cool flag. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. What's up? Welcome to the Sex Positive Podcast hosted by a comedian. That's not a comedy show. However, this week on the pod, I have got on fellow stand-up comedian, a fellow podcaster, co-host of the Hot Mess Comedy Hour. Yes, finally, we've got on Emily Lubin this week, the Lubination, and I'm really looking forward to sharing her with y'all in a little bit. But first, tomorrow night, people. Got another monthly man whore munch tomorrow, June 4th at 9.30 Eastern time. We are going to start counting down to my 31st birthday at midnight. The invitation for that awesome, fun, flirty Zoom call is going to go out to all of my $7 and up members on Patreon. So come celebrate my birthday with me. Uh, The first hour is pants required. That's just all I'm going to say there. Uh, and you can become a member at patreon.com slash man whore podcast. Um, I, let's just go ahead and address the, the elephant in the room. What's going on? It's on hopefully all of our minds. I'm going to try to keep it a little bit brief uh, because I know a lot of you might listen to the show like as a respite from the moral and political horrors we face in this country. Even if you're out there on the front lines or if you're out there protesting right now, you might be like, "Ah, you know, I just need to hear some slut stuff. So, you know, I'm not going to rant about systemic racism or social injustice for terribly long because I feel like I've been doing that already for for years and I don't really think I have anything new to say. I don't have a hot take that you can't hear from better educated scholars of color. But fuck, like my heart hurts so much. Right now, for many of my fellow Americans, black and brown Americans, queer Americans, low-income Americans who are nervous about rent, transgender Americans whose transitions in medicine and healthcare are up in the air right now, Asian Americans wrongly blamed for coronavirus, documented and undocumented immigrants who continue to live in fear in what is supposed to be a better life. It's an overwhelming amount of pain and it breaks my fucking heart sometimes lately it's made me not really want to do anything to be honest but it's a pain i think i as a very privileged intersection of identities need to sit in of course much attention really recently has been over the death of, of unarmed black people by the police Or in the case of Ahmaud Arbery, just a few private citizens who thought a black man jogging was suspicious. All of these protests you're seeing on TV, all these protests, the riots, the outrage. I mean, it's not all just about George Floyd. It's not all about this one thing. It's also about Breonna Taylor, who was shot while sleeping in her home after the cops busted in the wrong house 
without identifying themselves. It's also about Philando Castile. It's about Alton Sterling. It's about Eric Garner. It's about 12-year-old Tamir Rice, whose gun, yes, looked real, but I had the same gun when I was 12 because my mom secretly bought them for me and my cousin JD when we were at Sports Authority one time because JD's mom was like not about it. And no officer would have ever looked at us and then drawn their weapon. JD's getting married this weekend, by the way. Tamir Rice won't. Ever. It's about... It's about Sandra Bland, who died in a jail cell over a fucking traffic stop. It's about Walter Scott, who was running away from an officer and was shot eight times in the back from like 20 feet away on fucking camera over a traffic stop. It's about Trayvon Martin, a teenager who's just fucking walking and whose murderer was found not guilty, and then sold the gun he used for $250,000. It's also about Emmett Till, who only some of America will learn about in their history books, depending on which state you grew up in. It's about all the names that we say, and that we make trend, and then forget. And I'm just playing some of the hits right now. Like I'm not even getting into the B-side names you never heard of and never will. Now, I don't know what my role is. I don't know what my role is other than maybe calling out bullshit around me. I'm good at that, I think. You know, good for you if you march or riot or tweet or donate right now. You express your anger however you deem fit. I'm not going to tell y'all there's a certain way to protest because whatever way that is, uh, not working. I will say this. White people who think they're really great allies showing up to a protest in a large anonymous crowd in their big liberal city far away from home. If you don't bring that conviction back home to Thanksgiving, you're fucking up. Okay, it's not Black Lives Matter, except on Nana's birthday. I was told I was told ahead of a wedding one time to not get into fights with the bride's friends or the groom's more conservative family. But now I'd only get into a really big fight at an important wedding if they said something like, I don't know, racist or anti-queer or super fucking ignorant. And if you don't want a fight at your wedding, talk to your racist friends or question why you have friends you know say things that would get called out. Don't talk to me. Talk to Lindsay. Calling out a loved one should not be uncomfortable for you. It should be uncomfortable for them. Some of you are going to go home to Thanksgiving dinner and break bread with the next Travis McMichael. Now, you won't hear me pop off on every issue, every shooting, every news item on this podcast, in part because it's, it's not that type of podcast, you know? And if I was being 100% honest with what's on my mind, I, I'd be talking about social injustice every week. It's the topic that keeps on giving because no one wants to seem to fix it. But that's not why most of you are here. And there are a lot of way better people to listen to about that. But if you're ever, ever unclear about where I stand on an issue, any issue, shoot me an email. Ask me. Like, what do I do to fight systemic racism? I'm just really fucking annoying. And I won't let shit slide from dad's perspective business client at a nice dinner. That's the role I think I can play. And I hope you're figuring out what your role is, too, because we've all got one. So that's my thought on that. Now, there's very obviously no really good segue or transition. I'm not like Mark Maron. I can't can't transition from trauma into an ad read. So instead, we're going to deal with an email I got about fingering. I think that's going to be a nice palate cleanser. Then we're going to take care of a couple of points of business. And then we're going to get to Emily Lubin and we're going to have a really good show. I got this email from a fella. His name's Ryan. He writes, Hi, Billy. I've been listening to your podcast for several years now and was wondering if you could give me some insight on how I can improve my foreplay skills, especially when it comes to using my hands. Thanks and keep on whoring, Ryan. Ooh, the hand stuff. Yeah, Megan and I love the hand stuff. Sometimes she'll just be like, Hey, baby, can we can we do some hand stuff tonight? And I'm like... Oh, yeah, we can. Uh, hand stuff, fingering, cool. I'm not going to give you like technical tips on like what to literally do with fingers. 
So I'm not, there are better people to listen to. I've had on so many sex educators on this podcast. You should be following all of them on the Twitter and the social medias and such. Maybe pay them for a class. Um, there are plenty of sex educational videos like the Nina Hartley stuff. Okay. And then there, are, uh, you know, there's past sponsors on the pod, like beducated.com who specialize in teaching you the techniques of fingering. I'm not going to teach you that because I think none of it matters if you don't give a shit and you're not paying attention. So that's what I'm going to tell you to do. That's what I do. When I'm with a new partner, if I'm in front of a new vulva, I'm like, ooh, let's figure this one out, right? And you're going to know this based off like just paying attention to those nonverbals. Are they gasping? Are they breathing heavily? Are they moaning? Are they writhing with pleasure? Are they doing that thing where like you rub their clit the right way and, and then their left leg starts to fidget? Or are they laying very still? Are they not making any noise? Is there, is there like a blank expression on their face? Do they look like they're bored in math class? That's not a good sign. Pay attention for these things. One of the things I love to do is I just love to ask. Like, honestly, I like to accept that I'm a fucking idiot, but like I'm an eager to please idiot. Show and tell me what to do, but you express it in like a cool, confident way. You don't want to sound like you don't know what you're doing. When you ask someone like, tell me how you like it. You want to come from a sexy, confident place. That's why I try. Well, if I'm being perfectly honest, a lot of times I, I get meta and start cracking jokes. But if I really am tapped into a sexy, confident attitude, I'm coming from a place of, of I know what I'm doing. You want to make it sound like you have a bag of tricks. You just need help picking out which trick is best for this person. And that's exciting because like, oh my gosh, this... This guy's got all these tricks. I can't wait to see. I mean, I know the one that I want. I'm going to tell him, but maybe he's going to do something I've never had done to me before. That's exciting. So pay attention to the nonverbals. Be confident in what you're doing. And don't be afraid to ask for some help. For technique, look, go pay some sex educators for their online courses. I think, uh, I don't know if my promo code is still good at beducated.com, but if it's not, shoot them an email. I'm sure that they'll honor it if you ask for it. And, uh, you know, I hope that helps. If it makes anyone feel better, I still am learning how to do hand stuff with each new person I come across. And I've been dating Megan for almost a year. And I'm still still asking her, like, hey, can you show me how you like this particular thing? And if you have, you know, some comments, some questions, some tips and tricks for hand stuff or some titty pictures, you can send any and all of that over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. Okay. Okay. I told you we would cleanse the palate with some hand stuff. Okay. Now we're going to take care of a couple points of business. Let's do the fan whore appreciation moment. Let's be positive. Let's say some nice things about people, right? This is the part of the podcast where I like to give a few shout outs to members of my fan whore community on Patreon. Patreon is a great way to support uh, independent content creators like myself, as well as receive a slew of great rewards, including access to over 100 exclusive bonus episodes. So right now, I want to say a big old thank you to Emma Hurt, longtime caller, first time fan whore. Glad to have you on board, sweetie. Uh, Give a shout out and a thank you to Paul Evans in Manchester, which is apparently not in or near London. And anyone I talk to from the UK, I just assume you are in or near London. I treat Great Britain like it's Rhode Island. Like, ah, oh, you could go from top to bottom in 40 minutes. Apparently not the case, but I'm glad you're on board, dude. Uh, thank you to Geraldo Peralta. Pledged twice, gets two shout outs. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. And a big old thank you to this thing called Jesse. Uh, that is the IG handle for a talented photographer. Does a lot of kinky, sex pause, body pause uh, photography over on the Instagram. You can go follow him at uh, at this thing called Jesse, J-E-S-S-E. And you too can become a member for as little as $2 and gain access to exclusive bonus episodes and private sex positive discussion groups. Like our Facebook group, The Champagne Room. You can become a member today and support this podcast at patreon.com slash man podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash man podcast. I've got an exciting announcement to make before I get to this week's guest, Emily Lubin. Last point of order. 
I am thrilled to announce, and I did this uh, on my Instagram and my uh, my social media the other day on June 1st, but I am so excited to announce my partnership with altplayground.net, a lifestyle site dedicated to helping you find your next adventure. Yes, um, I've been kind of keeping this one tucked under my hat for a couple months now. But I have, uh, I have joined the APG family of podcasters who are helping spread the message about a new uh, connection platform and resource center for those curious about the non-monogamous lifestyle. Something I'm really, uh, you know, something that really sold me on APG when I was talking to the fine folks at their office was, you know, they really want to, to they really want to blend the old world swinger lifestyle scene with the new world non-monogamy, polyamory, various sexual orientation scene. Um, and so, and that was really a selling point for me when they said that that was the their vision for the platform because it's not supposed to just be. A lifestyle. It's not supposed to just be a swinger website where you can meet other couples to go fuck. There are plenty of people and sites that do that. What's making APG so special is they want it to be an experience. They want it to be a resource, a clean interface, constantly evolving features and fresh content that all provide enhancements to your non-monogamous dating experience. This open community for non-monogamous and sexually open people uh, allows them to connect, share, and create new adventures together. And I'm going to be there too. So who knows? Maybe we're going to have an adventure someday. APG has 20 years experience as a regional open lifestyle website. And it's now rolling out nationally. So go find me on there. Go take a look at some of my pics. Tell me I look cute. Uh, Go sign up today at altplayground.net. That's A-L-T playground.net. And let's create a new adventure together. Also part of the APG family, by the way, I hope I'm not blowing up their spy. I hope they've announced it and I'm not beating them to it. But the Hot Mess Comedy Hour, also part of the APG family. All right. Uh, so what a uh, what an appropriate time to have on the co-host of Hot Mess, Emily Lubin, who is also uh, just launching her own solo podcast project, RIP Diets. We're talking about you know, quarantined libidos. We're talking about sex ed. We're talking about eating disorder recovery. So let's just go ahead. I don't have to intro Emily. Most of you know her. Most of you love her. Let's go chat with Emily Lubin. Lubin Nation. Oh, yeah. The Man Whore Podcast is always excited to be sponsored by HotMovies.com. HotMovies.com is a pay-per-minute porn site that makes it both an ethical and affordable way to hashtag pay for your porn. They've even rolled out a new uh, playlist feature, kind of like YouTube. You know, let's take Nina Hartley, of course. You could go find a bunch of different Nina Hartley scenes from different movies, drag them into a playlist in the order you want, and now you've created your very own custom Nina Hartley porno. Isn't that cool? Here's another cool thing going on with me and Hot Movies. We are giving away cold, hard cash and free porn. Ethical free porn. Yes, um, you're soon going to be hearing a new segment here on the podcast called Whose Porn Is It Anyway? It's a short game show segment where you can win cold hard cash and free porn over at hotmovies.com. If you are curious and interested in playing this game anonymously, uh, shoot me an email at manhorpod at gmail.com. We'll get you informed. We'll get you signed up. Uh, and we'll get you playing and see what you could win. One more time, email me at manwhorepod at gmail.com to sign up for the new game show. And in the meantime, head on over to hotmovies.com yourself. Go sign up. Sign up for the free trial. You'll even get 20 bonus minutes when you use promo code manwhore at sign up. One more time, go to hotmovies.com. Use promo code manwhore for 20 extra minutes. Now let's get to the show. Y'all have a really nice beginning because, like, you know, there's this ridiculous karaoke that's going to start it. And then, mm-hmm. like, you know, you have your jumping off point, which is a, a, a yeah. love of mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's another thing that's like painful in the queue is doing the karaoke separately because we can't do it at the same time because, like I said, the it's not going to match up. So. We take turns week to week doing the karaoke song, and I just have to listen back to my voice. It takes me (laughs) 
on average, probably 10 to 12 times to perfect a karaoke song. That's what you don't Ooh. see. <laughs> That's what's behind the curtain at the Hot Mess mm-hmm. Comedy Hour. This is an hour. exclusive. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure many of y'all recognize the wonderful voice of Emily Lubin. Hello. Hey, guys. How you doing? It's nice to finally get you on the show. I've... uh I've been like meaning to have you on for forever. And when you said you had a new podcast coming out, I'm like, perfect. This feels like my mother's very in touch spiritually with the person upstairs. So she's like, that's a sign. And we should definitely. And I'm like, that felt like a Bobby sign. Like we should uh, be talking. Uh, <laughs> what's something What's something that your mom would say was a sign for something? Like what's an example? Um, hmm. It could be something like, uh, so my sister and her boyfriend or her fiance who have had to cancel their wedding twice now (laughs) because of Corona. Oh my God. Oh, that sucks. I, I'm like not a religious person, but I kind of do believe in signs Mm -hmm. in the sense that like everything that is going to play out is going to play out the way it's going to play out. Like I think that we have control over things more than we actually do and nobody knows what the future holds so it's kind of like a let go and let god but i don't believe in god you know i can't believe she chose so her wedding was supposed to be memorial day weekend and then she postponed it for mid-july like a moron i would have told her don't do that (laughs) wait she thought that the delay would just be a month and a half yeah Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I really feel for the people who are getting married and have like plans already set in place because I, one of my best friends, her wedding is, I mean, as of now, it's still on and it's going to be August 2020. <laughs> so this August. Uh-huh. But we all kind of know that that's not going to happen. So it's everybody's we're at a standoff right now of like waiting for her to be like, okay, it's canceled, but she hasn't yet. So I have to, you know, get like my bridesmaids dress fitted and whatever as if this fucking thing is happening. And I know it's it's not. It's like it's we all know. Why are we pretending like this is when the bridezilla stuff gets a little too intense? It's like how when do we stop placating Carol and tell her that the coronavirus doesn't care that you want to get married? (laughs) You know, how did you know my uh, best friend's name is Carol? Uh, Because you're from Long Island, not Connecticut, as I learned. (laughs) I am not from Long Island. Wait, wait. (sighs) Fuck me, Westchester. Where I am from, Westchester County. It's just like, I, and being from Bergen County, New Jersey, it's like Bergen County, Westchester, Long Island, Connecticut. It's all like a very similar type of white person. Listen, they're they're all like variations of the same beast, but <laughs> I I mean, Long Island is a little less classy. I think people just think I'm from Long Island because of the way I talk. I think I have a little bit of that accent, but it's only because I started talking that way to make fun of the people from Long Island who I went to SUNY Binghamton with. Uh, oh, SUNY Binghamton. Oh, I got a... Yes. We have a, we have a listener who is a uh, professor at SUNY Binghamton. Oh, really? Yeah. It's the Harvard of the SUNYs, don't you know? <laughs> I got invited to uh, I teleconference uh, taught a class, kind of, or something. I was like a guest... Oh, that's cool. I was like a guest lecturer via Skype to some like porn body class... At SUNY Binghamton one time. Uh, They're teaching a porn class now? I These kids don't know how good they have. Right? <laughs> it, back in my day, back when I was in college, if you wanted to take a bullshit class, you had to take like... Um, you had to take like fa- uh, literature of fairy tales. I was an English major and like I literally took a whole class on fairy tales and that was how you like would get out of a requirement. Now you can just watch porn with a professor and get graded on it. That's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I did. Uh, w- so I went to boarding school, right? And my my sophomore year, I negotiated a independent study art trimester class. Because you had to do a different art class every trimester to get your credit. So I negotiated. I was wow. I was learning uh, how to knit, and I negotiated doing independent study knitting. Shut the fuck up, Billy. My <laughs> my B period class was just me in my dorm room in my boxers knitting while watching South Park on my computer. <laughs> what did you knit? I was working on a vest that I never completed. <laughs> What color was the best? It was like a, it was a very, like a sky blue. Like, you know, I'm very oh conscious God. of the eye color. 
situation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you want to bring that out. You know, actually, opposite colors bring it out more. This this is color theory that they don't tell you. Opposite, or they do tell you, but like only if you take art classes. The opposite color on the color wheel actually brings out the color more. So you should be wearing orange. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> I know. It sucks, but you have to do it if you want to bring out those baby blues. Can you picture me in orange, though? Um, I can't picture you in most of the things you wear, so I feel like orange would be all right. <laughs> uh, what have you? How, so, what has been the quarantine uh, out? How, what's been the quarantine uniform uh, in your household right now? Uh, for me or for my boyfriend? For you and or your boyfriend? Bo- like, what are y'all like? I don't know. Does he come out and you're like, those are the sweatpants you chose? Uh, he doesn't really wear sweatpants. He's too um fancy so what he, what he usually wears shorts some kind of shorts and he is shirtless all the time oh lucky you yeah and he's hairless like a seal so i really enjoy it <laughs> you enjoy the hairlessness oh my god i love it yeah he he has um a few patches of hair on his chest that do grow in but i, I tweeze them he lets me tweeze them he gets hair patches on his chest that don't make sense type of thing um, yeah, like I- I'm talking like five hairs yeah. at a time and like some around the nipples. But other than that, he's hairless. He's been growing in a beard in quarantine because he can. Um, but it's even that is like a tad patchy. He's going to have to shave it down eventually. I actually told him the other day that I'm putting an embargo on my <laughs> ass until he um, completely shaves his beard. <laughs> uh, what about, wait, like shaving your asshole? Oh, or no, what do you mean? Like, oh, uh, on like anal. 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 Oh, okay. You're really yeah. about to find out which he loves more, your ass or his beard. <laughs> totally. And you know what? I'm confident. <laughs> uh, well, I'm confident I'm going to win this one. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you know, so both of us have been quarantining with our significant others. And I feel like you've been with Slam D for about a year, right? A year. Yeah. It'll be a year in uh, a week from now. Oh, then early congrats. We we hit a year in uh, in a month. We're going to be Oh, Mazel tov. In our one year. So it's it's interesting go cuz you don't live together, live together. You're just quarantined. No, right. I mean now we do. Right. But so it's it, it's a little weird. And you have to have like really good communication to do that cuz otherwise it'd be taking like a car from 0 to 80 without a steering wheel. Um well, I mean We had already been seeing each other like six nights a week by the time this happened. And I would come to his house on a Friday and stay the entire weekend. So it wasn't really, I don't remember there ever being a conversation about it. It was just like, yeah, this is what we're doing because we're not going to not see each other and not bone for (laughs) several months. So we had no idea how long this was going to last. Originally, I I figured like, yeah, we'll shack up for a few weeks and then we'll go back to our separate apartments. But now I'm at the point where I'm like, it's going to be really weird at the end of this. I mean, quote end. Yeah. But um, it's going to be really weird when I'm like, wait a second, we don't live together. (laughs) It'll feel like we're taking a step back in a way. I was I start so uh, I spent fifty one days uh, at Megan's and then uh, I came back to my mom's house and so right. like she's downstairs she'll spend a few nights here I spend a night or two there sometimes and so we do have some solo time and it was weird going from a quote unquote normal amount for dating to stay living together essentially and then we had this pullback where now I'm at my mom's a little bit more and I've I felt this like weird like separation anxiety. As if we had always lived together. I was like, we were together 51 days. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't handle, you know, 36 hours without her or something. Yeah, I know. Well, this is like a very stressful time. And I think that it's it's kind of um, when I think about it, it's like a little bit of artificial bonding because we are forced to spend way more time together than we normally would. But it is it does make you closer and it kind of doesn't really matter if it's artificial or not because these are the circumstances. So I kind of think like that separation anxiety is completely normal given this whole um, state of affairs. Yeah. Well, I mean, what sort of, uh, I mean, have y'all had any uh, difficulties uh, adjusting to all this being together or was your like previous frequency of dating, you know, kind of made it easy? Um. 
I I feel like I feel almost guilty saying this, but it's been great. <laughs> There's no problems. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Like I just I, gave I, it a finger. And you know, I ho- I host a podcast called Hot Mess, which you already said, but I we have been recording remotely with a lot of people, so you know, we have to do the routine check-in. How's everybody doing? How's everybody spending quarantine? And it feels a little awkward when people ask me because I feel I feel guilty. Like I feel like I could honestly do this forever if I needed to. <laughs> it must be like like yeah. Sorry, I I'm I'm just uh, it, it's you know it can be a little excessive spending all your time with someone, and definitely in the first two weeks we didn't really know what was up. We didn't have anything to do. I had been taking like a very brief hiatus from the podcast because we recorded extra just in case of emergency Mm -hmm. and then there was an emergency. So I was spending all my time in bed with Andy watching Vanderpump Rules. And I watched eight seasons of Vanderpump (laughs) Rules in three weeks, which is uh, to this day, probably one of my greatest TV watching accomplishments. Um, I think you'll. But then, <laughs> so, but then after a few weeks, you just get fucking sick of it. So then, w- like now, our schedules are a little more structured and a little. There's a little more time apart, but apart sometimes just means going in the other room. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and did you have to like? Did you all to kind of sit down and decide like we're gonna have a little bit more of a structured alone time, or is it just kind of naturally fell in place? It just naturally fell into place, like as we realized that we would be here longer than we needed than we originally thought. So it it really just happened naturally, and uh, we have a pretty good sense of how much alone time the other person needs. I think. Okay, okay, and and it's nice that you have the the regular boning, which I feel like I. <laughs> I f- I it, it also is weird seeing so many friends like you know Andrea or whoever else complain about like <laughs> they can't touch another human. Yeah, the sluts are not doing well right now. But like you and I, we're like I don't know. I've got someone grabbing my ass. So I'm good. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean not entering my ass until the beard is gone. Mm. But <laughs> you get used to having sex every single day. Also, yeah, I- like it. He, my, my boyfriend, um, like he will need to rub one out. I hope this is not too much information. He can hear me from the other side of the door, but whatever. He will like need to rub one out if there's one day where I'm like, nah, I don't want to have sex. And that's just like hilarious to me that you would need to, um, drain the demon, drain the dragon, as they say, after one day of not having sex. But you just, you get used to it, I guess. For me, I don't know what it is. I, I didn't jerk off for the first like three weeks, but we weren't fucking a lot either because I was just so like down about everything. Uh, it was so strange. But then once I started stroking it out again, I was like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's like I had to explain to Megan. Like, I mean, she kind of gets it, but it, it definitely was odd. Also, like living with her and wanting to actually just masturbate. And we do, I know. we do plenty of mutual masturbation. We're not shy about like, we're going to do that. But sometimes I'm like, I just want a little bit of solo time. And so it's weird, like when you have access to sex, but you still are like choosing to masturbate instead. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I would kind of um, not want to tell him because I wouldn't want him to feel bad that like, <laughs> I'd rather spend the next 15, 20 minutes alone. Oh. But it's a completely different thing. It scratches a different itch, and I understand when he does it. So I, yeah, it's it's you gotta understand these are two separate things. Uh, did you have to like restock up on sex toys like when this was? <laughs> no, I I have a couple with me. I've I've defaulted to one that does most things that I need. Most of the work. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, not most. No, not most of the work. <laughs> Just like I had a few odd, like weird toys that I bought to because I was bored of like my old faithful. And now I've pretty much defaulted to my old faithful. I want to know what the main one is. But I do. When you said you had weird toys, I was like, I know. I think you said you're like a proponent of that weird one that like spreads the labia. I don't like. Yeah, I, so- I, do, I still don't understand how that one even could work. Have you tried it? It just, it looks like a fucking little, it looks like a bug. It looks It looks weird. like an alien. It looks I, gross. I, liter- I call it, I call it E.T. Because it's green and it looks like a little alien. <laughs> um, no, okay, I'll show you my 
Old Faithful. This is from the company Tanga. Oh! And it's shaped like a snowman. It's called Yuki. It's so cute. It fits like right in your hand. And it feels like the texture is like, um, I don't know what it's made of. Maybe like, it doesn't feel like silicone. It feels like a finger. Like it feels like flesh. And it has just like very simple vibration. And that's what I use. Wait, so is that an insertable toy or you're putting that on a clit? No, I put that on my clit and then I need something else. Like I usually need like fingers or dicks. Yeah. I mean, one dick, usually <laughs> one dick. I mean, yeah, one day. Have you had Have you had two dicks at the same time? No, I haven't. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know that it's possible. I just don't. I can't envision how my pussy would accommodate that. Just watch the, a birthing video in reverse and you'll be like, oh, it gets True. big. <laughs> True. But like your cervix doesn't dilate when you're getting ready to have two dicks in one hole. It does if you're turned on enough. I mean, it's the difference between that. I mean, like, for ex- I, I won't speak for you, but like sometimes I can get th- Four finger. Oh, oh, well, let's use Andrea. Sometimes you can fist Andrea Allen, <laughs> right? Sometimes. Sometimes you can only yeah. get two fingers in. It depends on how turned on she is. Oh, God. <laughs> well, or or uh, how much she is staving off having sex with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to put your mind at ease by letting all five fingers in there. She's just like thinking in her head it's either like this amount of pain or sex with Billy Presido. Yeah, not- she's like, I gotta, I gotta take one for the team. I need <laughs> Billy's fist is better than Billy's dick. Like, like Megan tells me, like she can do anal, just like she has to be really turned on. Oh to yeah, be able totally, to do it. and and warmed up and prepped, and y- yeah, it's. You can't just like go from nothing to a whole fist up your pussy or a whole dick up your ass. Like those are two areas in which you definitely need to be prepped. <laughs> we have we have this lube. It's called Sassy Booty Gel. Do you know what do you know about this? I mean, I see it's a Sliquid brand. Yeah, it's a Sliquid brand. It's liter it it's called Sassy Booty Gel and it is quite sassy. Yep. So we use that. Okay. Um yeah, I I I definitely need to be warmed up. I'm not the type of person that can just um come from straight penetration, but few women are. Mm. Well, so what what has been like this, you know, constant boning been like for y'all? Like is are the sex drives kind of up and rare in the whole time? Are y'all doing it every day? I mean, what Yeah, it's totally different and like in the past couple weeks, I have been spending more, like I said, we've been spending our days a little more separately. And it does, like I ha- I've i regained that feeling a little bit of mm-hmm. like, oh, I haven't seen you all day and now we're hanging out and this is so nice. Um, but I, yeah, it hasn't been a problem. Our, like we both have pretty high sex drives, so it, it really hasn't been an issue. His might be like just a tad higher than mine, but I think it's more that he's a guy and like he gets turned on by like a finger snap. <laughs> like I could breathe in his ear and he gets turned on. He's just like a very sexual um, being. So yeah, but it's pretty even. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I will purposely suggest that we skip a day because it's then it's better the next day. That- but that's just my experience. Like I've just I've always been like a pretty sexual person. Once I get into a groove, I have gone in the past like weeks or mo- I probably I've probably gone like 4 months before without having sex mm-hmm. at all, but I was masturbating every day. Like I've always been pretty sexual. Okay. But it- you know what? I I actually was meaning to ask you a question. And I totally forgot to answer when you came on Hot Mess a, a couple weeks ago. Do you hear uh, Megan and her other boyfriend having sex ever? Or are you is the layout like spread up, out enough that you don't hear it? Without getting into too many details about their sex life, uh, I have never heard them have sex. Oh, OK. You wouldn't mind. It wouldn't be awkward. I don't think you know what like it's it's weird it's hard to answer it like without being in the scenario because my mind says of course it's fine but you know it would depend on factors like am I hearing her have sex but she's been denying me sex for six days for example or you know right. it, it could be stuff like that so and and this has come up between me and Megan where you know 
there were some issues about like feeling desired by me. And part of it had to do with, you know, seeing me want or do things with other people and not getting it the same way herself. So it wasn't that I was sleeping with other people. She just wanted to make sure that like I wanted to do the things with her that I do with other people. Okay. Yeah, I could see that being um touchy. Like, but but you're not even seeing people right now. Do you mean before quarantine that was an issue or before quarantine was an issue and then like during quarantine there were still low issues with it um because like we weren't having as much sex in the beginning because I was also like incredibly like just sad about the state of affairs and, yeah, and yeah. everything. Um, I mean, we had some, you know, great sex uh, this morning. You know, the the sex life is working. Everybody, you don't have to be concerned. But um, yeah, it's definitely like something we spent the first. Like, <laughs> You're gonna get emails. <laughs> well, we spent the first few weeks definitely like having some serious conversations like around desire and our sex life and how we communicate what we want when we want it. Um, you know, my libido's been low, but also I'm not a mind reader, so. It just kind of depends. And she's also been getting really good. Like right now, she's like reteaching me how to finger her. How to how to finger her? Yeah. Honestly, like Megan is like a sexual dynamo to the point that like it's making me rethink my sexual like uh, uh, aptitude. Style. It, yeah. Style s- separately. <laughs> but yes, also that uh, before quarantine started, like I had already been thinking about like, I think I want to like do a sex audit, like a fuck audit. I think I need to watch some people have sex. <laughs> I just want to like examine some different types of. Yes, it's educational. Yeah, like you, you just always want to check in on yourself. You don't want to just get like complacent. So I was like, oh, maybe I'm. Ja- am I jack herring too much? What are the What are the kids doing these days? Are there new positions I need to try? Uh, oh my God, you're like watching porn, taking notes. <laughs> yeah, didn't you? That's how I picked up some early tricks. That's how you learned. Yeah, I mean, well, sadly, because the state of sex ed in this country, it's how I learned. But, you know, then there's that whole media literacy of like looking at a scene and seeing that it's a porn scene for viewing purposes and it's not realistic. Yeah, sex sex ed is such a joke. And like you grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in New York. Those are t- two very liberal places. So I shudder at the thought of what sex ed is like in, in you know, um, the weaker states. So, the weaker ones. <laughs> the weaker ones, because the str- even the stronger ones, like my sex ed teacher in high school, her name was Miss Idella. She was this older, like brassy woman. And I remember she took this was this is an example of a lesson that she gave. <laughs> she brought a condom into class and she said, ladies, <laughs> if your boyfriend ever tells you that he's too big for one of these, just tell him that you saw me do this. And then she blows up the condom like eight feet long. <laughs> and she's like, done. You're done. Dump him. <laughs> and that that was the entire class. That's like what I remember. She also had, oh, she also had a vagina model like a model uterus mm. and she would show us how to like insert diaphragms and this shit. is where and i got us- cancer in 85 <laughs> exactly <laughs> also in my lungs because i'm a smoker the only sex so i went to boarding school in connecticut and it was such a weird alternative thing like it wasn't a conservative school but it was just like oh you went to boarding school oh yeah four years fascinating yeah did you do that because you were getting bullied so bad yep but i but I brought up the boarding school just to say like my my we didn't teach sex ed at the whole school they're literally it wasn't absent so they just didn't have it the only sex ed we got was like freshman biology they taught us like literally how sperm works and that's like one week but outside of that one class one time uh there was an annual boys dorm meeting and every year, Pam Birchie, she would come to the guy's dorm. There would be a, a dorm meeting, and she would explain the statutory rape laws of Connecticut. Oh, my God. That was the only sex ed. was like, don't do this. Yes, a toe counts. And that was that was it. That's all I got. Wait. So did you have health education? No. That is wild to yeah. me because and legal. that's like the one thing. Yeah, for sure. But like that's also one of the things that you absolutely need going into adulthood. Like they teach you so many things that you don't need and they leave out the things that you do. It's just bananas to me. 
Yeah, it, it really is crazy. And so freshman year of college, I got to NYU and then I'm like, they're, you know, NYU, they give you stuff to the freshmen to learn about STDs you can get and safer sex practices or whatever. And I was like, I didn't even know all these STDs were there. And I didn't even know there were these STDs you could get, like, even when you use a condom, like all that's I didn't know any of it. It's not. I mean, that's absolutely you should have been taught about STDs. That's like, I, I mean, yeah, of course. But also, it needs to be more comprehensive. I need to know how to talk to somebody about whether they have STDs. I need to know, like, when, um, when, like, to know if somebody should get tested before we have sex. Like, mm-hmm. you don't learn all of these small nuances that are really, really important. And I've noticed, I listened to um, Dan Savage, Mm -hmm. um, and I listened to like a few other podcasts that are like sex advice based questions. And I just noticed that, and Dan Savage will even say this, the answer to the question usually is talk to your partner. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? (laughs) And I feel like we do not learn how to do that. And we, that's the one thing we need to know how to do. It's the one thing that'll solve all your problems. Even even if your partner, you know, his circumcised his uncircumcised dick, like might have an issue. And oh my god, I, I forgot had, about that. I just listened to your Jesse Jollis episode yesterday, where like y'all brought up how wrong I was. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> you knew you knew that we all thought you were wrong. What you didn't know was how wrong the listeners would think you were. That's where and I underestimated now you know. it. <laughs> No, I, I, I really think I think you have an affliction where like you pick an argument and it's very, very difficult to get you to come to the other side. So I think like I understand where you were coming from initially, but I, I I've noticed that with you that it's it's hard. I rarely see you change your opinion. You might modify it a little bit, but mm. you stick to your guns. Yeah, I'm definitely to a fault. I, I definitely need a good reason to change my mind. And I've been big on like incremental changes, like and and ways of thinking of things. I mean, you know, the hearing the all the different opinions about how I differed on this advice question, which y'all can hear on the Hot Mess Comedy Hour with me and Megan on it um, yeah, from a in. few weeks ago. Uh, check it out. But you know. I hear those opinions. I hear the feedback afterwards. I start thinking of it differently. Maybe it pops up again somewhere else. So I'm I'm very stubborn with changing my mind, but like I will change my mind. Yeah, I I mean, you know, I've said plenty of things that I don't stand by anymore. I've been podcasting for five years, so <sighs> you're bound to say something that isn't going to sit well with everybody, mm-hmm. and you have to have an opinion. Like the best. The best um, radio personalities, the best podcasters, honestly, I think the best performers, they have a certain point of view and they do stick to it. Mm. Not to say that they could never be changed, but I, I, I think conviction is important, especially in podcasting. You have to just have an opinion. Well, it makes you different but- from everyone else. It's like, you know, well, why is this, you know, I, I might have an opinion that's so apparently off from like you, Andrea and Megan and all of your listeners. <laughs> but um But that's interesting but, to hear but, also. I I do think it's interesting to right. hear a negative. It's like people don't watch um a debate with just one side. Mm-hmm. They want to watch they want to hear what both sides have to say. Why don't you tell us what the the new podcast is and what it's about? So the the new podcast is called RIP Diets. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's you can listen to a sm- sneak peek now, actually, on Spotify and iTunes. But the first episode will be dropping next week. I don't know when this is coming out, but this should be out June third. This will be out. Oh, okay. So it'll already be out by the time this is out. Fantastic. Um, and it is about rejecting diet culture and um, also a system of eating called intuitive eating that is basically the anti-diet. So it's like we're starting an anti-diet revolution. I'm talking about my experience having been a chronic dieter and then crossing over into eating disorder territory and then coming back from it, relearning how to eat without all the stress and anxiety around food. Mm -hmm. And how have uh, how have you been holding up in quarantine? Like, how have you been doing with your relationship to food and your body? I'm doing great. Um, I mean, 
I've been working at Hey, can this you for... struggle? Can you struggle like a little bit? Can you be can you have like a rough <laughs> time with something <laughs> i'm sorry guys i'm in the prime of my life and i'm not apologizing for it i'm just not and you know why because i spent so many years in such a dark place i was in such a lonely horrible place for my entire um early to mid 20s and i hated myself and i hated my body and i really was stuck in a cycle of hell that i could not escape from and n- until i rejected everything that I had learned before and everything I had been taught before about how I should see my body and and um, how I should go about try to trying to change it and and um, controlling my weight and all of that stuff that I thought was so important it wasn't until I completely rejected all of that that I finally started to feel like myself and I finally started to really love my life. So for me, I just want to like spread that positivity mm-hmm. to other people and and say like, you can live this way too. You don't have to um, fit into one type of ideal body or like what whatever you think the ideal body is, you can exist in the body that you have right now and live an amazing life and feel great about yourself. Mm-hmm. And and when, so we've, we've never like, we d- I always had over the years like a closer relationship with Andrea than with you, but like with yeah. you two as a unit, I've been over on your show so many times and I knew, you know, I know that we got chemistry and that we've talked about, um, you know, eating disorder or stuff before. I remember when I started listening to Hot Mess though, I really, in my head, I was like, oh, I connect with Emily. I was like, oh, Emily and I share a thing. When you would talk about eating the salsa, but not the <laughs> chips, right? Like how you just eat yeah. salsa just for, and I was like, oh my God, like that's the type of fucked up thinking that I still get caught up in. Uh, yeah. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I, I used to, it, it's funny because um, I had, so I primarily had bulimia, but I did go through long periods of restriction. I could never um, make myself throw up. I would try so hard and it just wouldn't happen. <laughs> Don't try it. It's not good for you. It it also fucks up your teeth. I used to have dentists ask me if I was making myself throw up. And I would always say no, but they can tell yeah, the difference. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really not good for you. It also it hurt it makes you it doesn't even the thing is, even if you think in your mind, I want to be thin, thin equals attractive, even if you think that. You're not going to achieve it by being bulimic. You are going to look like a beached whale. Like I looked bloated all the time. If you look at pictures from back then, I was really uh, lanky and thin. And then I had this big puffy bobblehead face um, because my I, my glands were so swollen because I was making myself throw up a lot. I also I took laxatives. I did like a ton of stuff that w- is not good for you. Um and, w- and, and when is this I, happening in your like age range? Um, twenty three to twenty five. Oh my gosh! So like, when I first probably met you like five six years ago, you were still battling that. Absolutely, I was still battling it even when we started Hot Mess, and I was entering state my stages of recovery. I was in fake recovery. I didn't know it until later on, but I still had all of these fucked up behaviors around food that I didn't know how to correct. Um, so you know, may- maybe I would try. I was I I think shortly after I was trying to do intuitive eating, uh, which I talk about a lot, but then. I would try it and and then I would get scared and I would backtrack a little bit. And then so that whole process was delayed, like honestly, two years wow. because I kept going back and forth, back and forth. And you can't really be like one foot in, one foot out with intuitive eating. You can't be like, OK, I'm, I'm going to do intuitive eating, but I'm also going to make sure that I don't eat above X amount or I don't eat above X times in a day. You can't because that's the opposite of intuitive eating. Mm. Intuitive eating is just eating what you feel like eating when you feel like eating it. And what was I mean, what was the turnaround to go from what you called like a fake recovery into like true recovery? So I went to a therapist. I went to a cognitive behavioral therapist and she had me write down everything that I ate throughout the day and then write how I felt next to it. 
um, and how, how it made me feel, how I felt before and after. Um, and then just after doing that, um, oh, and then we would, we would talk about it. I mean, she would, she would give me tips and stuff, but really for me, learning that doing the same behavior over and over and, um, noticing every time how you do not burst into flames. Like I used to think that if I ate a slice of cake, that I would be fat the next day. Like that's how I, and I would see it reflected in the mirror. Like it, your mind starts to play tricks on you that way. You that point I out really a part of your think, body and you're like, that was that cake right there, right? This exactly, specific spot. Exactly. And for me, I always would, it would be, would be my face. Mm. I just hit the mic. I'm sorry. Or it would be my stomach. I have like a, a little like pooch as, as the ladies say, a lot of women have that. Um, and I also have like a more round, like, uh, youthful looking face. So that's like where I would perceive, but it's only because I was, I'm insecure about those areas of my body that I would see them as having changed. Um, and once you do it enough times, like once I would eat a slice of cake enough times and notice that, Oh, I'm actually, I actually feel great. I actually look the same because it was just a fucking slice of cake mm -hmm. and I didn't die. I do that enough times and then it becomes a habit and that that's how I did it. Do you sometimes like you eat the slice of cake and you're like, everything was fine. And sometimes you have the slice of cake and you're like, oh, maybe I actually didn't want to have that slice of cake. Like, do you ever notice that you were like, eat the same food would cause different reactions based off the motivation for eating it? Does that make sense? Totally. Yes, totally. And that's, that's why intuitive eating is really hard because it's a process. It's not something that you're supposed to do perfectly. You might notice, like sometimes I notice, oh, I ate way more Chinese food than I actually needed because it was delicious and uh, now I feel bad and now I need to like lie down. I, I don't feel my best. But that's just information. Mm -hmm. That's just information that I know for later that, okay, I, I actually like, I don't need to go so crazy on this Chinese food because I can leave it in the fridge and there's going to be more later. And I, when I actually want it, I'm actually going to feel way more satisfied than when I'm just stuffing my face. But at the same time, I don't pass judgment on myself for stuffing my face. I don't pass judgment on myself for eating, quote, emotionally, which seems to be like a trigger word for a lot of people. Like, oh, I'm an emotional eater. It's like we're all emotional eaters. Food is very comforting and it's okay to eat for reasons other than physical hunger. Is, is, is that whole awareness, constant awareness and thinking, I mean, is that exhausting? Um, it can be hard, but it, it just, it gets more natural over time, just like anything else. It's like, it's kind of like when you first start playing a sport or you first start, um, uh, like working out or do, like doing certain exercises. At first, you need to check your form constantly. And then eventually it kind of becomes second nature to you. Even, even last night, I ate, um, I love sweet things. Like I love, I, I'm, I have a huge sweet tooth. So I eat, cereal at night. I eat ice cream. Like I just, I love sweets. My boyfriend has been on a charcuterie kick. So he comes into bed with like sliced <laughs> salami and sliced cheese and fig jam and crackers. And I had already eaten like two bowls of cereal. So I was, I was just not hungry, but he's offering He's offering me like this delicious looking cracker with brie and salami and whatever. And I, I'm like, oh, I need some of that. So he he um cuts it and he like puts it on a cracker for me. And then I'm like, oh, actually, I don't need it. And he's like, OK, psycho. Like, what do you, what do you mean? You, I'm like, you just said you did want it. Now you don't want it. I'm like, I, I I'm like really full. And I just looked at it and I wanted it. But now that I thought a little bit more about it, I'm. I can't eat it. I'm full. And and the reason's not because you're worried about it, the effect it's going to have on your body as other than you don't actually feel like you need to eat that right now. I just didn't. I Yeah, I didn't really want it. I was eating. I was I was looking at it with my eyes, even though my stomach mm -hmm. was full, you know, it was that. And I know it's going to be there later and I'm going to enjoy it more when I really, really want it. Okay.
Uh, it, it, the answer of this one doesn't have to be yes, but did you see any change in your sex life once you were more steadily in recovery? Yeah, absolutely. How so? Yeah. Uh, well, what, so when I was like in my disorder, um, so in my early 20s, I remember I was so self-conscious during sex. I never had an orgasm. Mm. Never. Um you know, I would I would have them alone. I could make myself come, but I would never ever come with a partner. Um, I never would be able to let my guard down. I was constantly I wasn't able to live in the moment because I was very self conscious about my body. And pe- listen, I mean, if someone's having sex with you, they do not care about like if something's uh, hanging out mm. in a way that you don't want to. And if they did, then fuck them. Yeah. But but I I would worry about that a lot. Um, so yeah, I I wasn't able to enjoy sex at all, oh. really at all. Well, I'm glad unless I was shit faced. Sometimes I would get shit faced, um, and that was like another thing that I would do to cope with that. But no, it's my sex life is one hundred and fifty percent better now. That's beautiful. I'm very happy to yeah. hear that. Uh, well, uh, Emily, you got some time for a little bonus episode. Uh, talk a bit about the ass eating that you're so <laughs> infamous for. Hell yeah. All right. Uh, well, for now, uh, where can people find you and find your new show? You can find me at Lubination. That's L-U-B-I-N-A-T-I-O-N on Instagram. Um, and you can listen to my podcast, Hot Mess Comedy Hour, which is on, I mean, it's available anywhere you get podcasts. And you can listen to my new show, R.I.P. Diets. Um, and like I said, you can listen to a sneak peek right now on iTunes and Spotify. Fantastic. And uh, who are the types of guests you're having on R.I.P. Diets? So there, it, at first, it's going to be solo. Okay. And then I'm I'm going to have guests. They're going to be in the more body positivity um, or th- there might also be comedians, but comedians who have specifically had experience. Don't worry, in, I wasn't like, pitching um, myself. I <laughs> <laughs> just ki- just ki- just curious. No, what no, no, no. <laughs> no, Billy. Actually, you would qualify because you have had experience in the uh, in the chronic mm. dieting realm. I would worry that you would be a little problematic. So maybe you know, <laughs> just because you're still, you, you know, you, I'm, I'm you still, still in the struggle. Like, I, I'm absolutely. I'm, I'm nowhere. I'm not even pretending I'm in recovery. I I, I treat my you know my eating disorder like uh, my gambling problem. I'm like it's there. Uh, and that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Well, everyone, go check her out. Go check out those shows. And uh, Patreon members, you'll hear some more of us tomorrow. But for now, Emily, why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody? Goodbye to everybody. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I have to tell you to go follow Emily Lubin on the socials. I assume most of you already do. But if you're not, what do you? What? Why? Uh, of course, at this point, I assume you're all po- following me on the socials. I mean, you know, I have Instagram, right? I think a lot of you forgot that uh, I lost my Instagram, but I have a new one now. You should go follow it at Billy is Persida. Of course, I'm on Twitter still at the Billy Persida. If you want to shoot me an email with your comments, your questions, your criticisms, your titty pictures, you can send any of that on over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. I hope you'll be joining me tomorrow night, June 4th, the countdown to my 31st birthday. Ah, love hanging out with my Patreon members. Uh, All the $7 and up members will receive an invitation tomorrow with the Zoom link. I hope you'll be there. You can become a member and join us at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash podcast. Next week, we've got a the controversial co-author of the Polly book, More Than Two. We got a two-parter coming up with Franklin Vo. Get ready to get into it. Rest in power, George Floyd. <laughs>